Righty ho. Uh, good afternoon there, Bronwyn Williams from Johannesburg. How's it going today? Thanks so much for joining me on the Ridiculously Human podcast. Thank you for inviting me. How is uh, how's the motherland today? Like, yes, I haven't been back in in ages. Actually, since since before COVID, I, I left literally ten days. I think before like everything started shutting down, my wife and I left for Brazil. So, how how is the the motherland? Uh, it's all right. Uh, it's it's chaotic, but that's why that's why we're here, right? Uh, South Africa is an interesting place. It's never going to be dull, and I think it's a uh, it's been a challenging year for a lot of people in a lot of different ways. But as I like to say to all of the the panicking people sticking up for sale signs outside of their houses, the rest of the world is not exactly that comfortable either. So. You know, when it comes to the future, you got to sort of pick your own shade of uncertainty, right? Yeah, I 100% agree. Like there doesn't seem to be anywhere at the moment, which seems to be like, okay, cool, let's go there because things are awesome. You know, it's like, wow, it's kind of, it's kind of a really weird time that we're going through at the moment. So, so yeah, South yeah. Africa certainly has its challenges, but then there's so many awesome things about South Africa too, and just South Africans in general and their attitude. So that's something to really enjoy, I think. Yeah, and I actually wrote a chapter for a book like right when COVID started. I think it was the the things that every South African business owner must know by Tracy McDonald Publishing. And like my essay was on how South Africans are particularly good at chaos. I mean, we've had uncertainty really since the dawn of the formalization of South, the South African project. You know, whenever you want to sort of pick an, a number, a year when that would have started or not, it's never been secure. We've always been weeks away from potential disaster, potential meltdown. You know, this is this is a basic status quo of living in this country. And that can go in two different ways. On the one hand, it means that we're very good at dealing with things when they break down. So I think South Africans panicked a lot less when COVID happened compared to other nations where things had not gone wrong ever before in their lives, for example. But at the same time, it also means that we can be a bit complacent. We can have that bit of that sort of frog in a pot, that proverbial frog that doesn't actually exist in the real world, in a pot syndrome where we kind of don't worry, we'll be okay with this with this too. So, you know, it's, it's both a case of being less afraid or, and less panicking in the case of chaos, disaster, problems, but also perhaps we do err on the side of complacency. I mean, just the very fact that apartheid lasted as long as it does is astonishing. I think that is that is the story of South African exceptionalism. If you look at what played out across the rest of the continent and the balance of power and the intellectual minds we had in this space, what are the reasons that make South Africans okay with things falling apart around them? What makes us so self-reliant, What makes us so patient, but also at the same time, what makes us so complacent? I think that's an interesting one to unpack. Yeah, you know, it's actually really interesting because I, I wrote something this week around tolerance that I think tolerance mm. is probably the, the weakest human trait uh, in terms of, you know, the, the more you tolerate, like say of someone treating you badly, the more you're going to kind of like feel this disdain towards them. Or, you know, if we do it as like a society, like you were saying in South Africa, we, we kind of tolerated apartheid, you know, South Africa's tolerated mm -hmm. energy issues. And it yeah. doesn't really get you anywhere. Do you know what I mean? It certainly doesn't fix things. It does mean that you're able to continue with your, with your life. <laughs> you know, that you can make your own little bubble. And we see this, we see this uh, with anyone that can afford it. You know, we have retreated due to crime behind walls. We've retreated into the little solar islands if you can afford it. I mean, we've we've built essentially medieval forts and keeps, right? So we can sort of pretend what's happening outside doesn't really exist. I think this is again happening all across the world. I mean, like you couldn't have missed the headlines of the global billionaires wanting to sort of set up bunkers and self-sufficient communities in like northern New Zealand or wherever the, the case might be, or somewhere out in the Nevada desert. These ideas of sort of prepping and being able to take yourself away from society. It's very Anne Rand, right? For those of you who who either love or loathe the lady, right? So no sort of gold slutch and this idea that the elites can sort of retreat. And live in live in their little like fairy kingdom they don't have to worry about what's going on with all the rest of it or more recently like the networked states and you know the 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 thought leaders who are proposing those sorts of things it's a very south african idea right so retreat behind your wall 
either it's behind your own house or into your gated community or into your waterfall Dane Fern estates. I don't know what you have in Brazil. It's similar, but we do know these exist. I mean, compounds are quite an African story too. So close, bring up the drawbridges and sort of carry on with your life. But it certainly doesn't fix the problems that you're trying to escape from. Yeah, so, ab absolutely. Those Something that I find really interesting about South Africans, which I was actually thinking about this weekend, is is South Africans are amazing networkers. Like it's, it, if you go to South Africa, it, you, you like, you're like, oh, I wonder, does anybody know this person? And they're like, yeah, no, 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 I know. Like my mates, you know, like I train with him at the gym and he like, he knows him, like they work out together. There's, there's something really amazing about South Africans and networking and like, you, you know, there's that kind of, what's it called? Like six degrees of separation or something like, but South Africa I reckons like three, you know what I mean? Like you need three people to know flipping Nelson Mandela, for example. It's, it's quite a, quite an interesting, interesting thing, especially not because I've lived out of South Africa for like over 20 years now. And I, I, but I noticed that that's sort of phenomenon doesn't really exist like it does in South Africa. I don't know if you've like thought about that much yourself. Right. The whole of South Africa. I mean, we have these conversations quite a lot. I think it's quite a Johannesburg kind of a thing. Like uh, Cape Town's quite different. You can, I mean, I know people who've never met each other that have lived in Cape Town their whole lives, but I know they both, right? So like it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's it's a, it's a kind of a thing. But I think that actually just recently, this last couple of weeks, I've been reading a, a book on the Daisy Demelka story, who was like the first or second woman hung in South Africa for poisoning a string of string of husbands and a whole lot of her children. She was quite an infamous woman back in the day. But the way the author wrote that book, because he really spoke about the chaos that Johannesburg was and the melting pot that this place was and how it was cosmopolitan from the day the city was set up. That makes it quite different. Even the other settlements that took place in South Africa, there really was nothing here, you know, until all these different people with all these different cultures all arrived in this particular patch of land to dig the, dig the gold out of the ground. And weird connections were formed. There was always criminality. There was always the sense of lawlessness, but particularly in Johannesburg. And I think it's different around the coastal areas, which have more European influences or have more traditional influences of the original, you know, communities who, who populated this land. Johannesburg was is different it was it is a city of immigrants that always has been very much almost like new york city for example and i think that sort of sense of hustling that's this whole idea of connecting with people knowing people is, is a sense of necessity too it's part of this sort of make a plan mentality that took this very ragtag bunch of people from all across the world and from local from from closer locales put them all together threw them into this literal pits that we kind of dug, dug this sort of city of brimstone and fire and prostitutes and murderers and the whole lot you know and these, these are the people that we're kind of descended from right this is the sense of making a plan making something out of literally nothing and how there was nothing in Johannesburg other than what people made of it right I mean naturally speaking it's not the most beautiful part of the country people weren't coming here for tourism they're still not people come here to make a life and, that's, and people are still coming here to make a life, right? That means you have to reach out of yourself. You have to make connections. You have to have that making a plan mindset is, I think, very much baked into the culture here. There are a few other parts of the world where that has taken place. But I think the fact that we are kind of like this inland island does make the place quite special. And people that do come from this part of the world do tend to find each other, I think. Mm. Sure. I'd, I'd actually never, well, I didn't really know that, that history of Joburg. So, so thanks for mentioning that, but I hadn't thought about it that way. So yeah, I, I guess it makes a lot of sense. And, and I always, like I do here, like, you know, say from, from living in London for quite a long time, like people are like, yeah, I know the guys in Joburg are, you know, you guys are a bit more maybe friendly, you know, and I guess the, the guys in Cape Town are maybe a little bit more clicky and stuff. So, so it, it makes a lot of sense with, with what you said there. Um, it's also a nice segue, like you're talking about books there, like part of, um, should I say, researching uh, guests is actually a lot of stalking that, that also goes on <laughs> um, in a very polite way though, you know, um, I was, I was having a look at your, at your Instagram and I mean, you are one ferocious reader. Uh, you you definitely like you every now and then you seem to post like, okay, this pile of five books and they and they're not like your normal books. You know, these are like really cool, interesting books. Um, I just wonder, like, where did that love for for reading come from? Well, I started reading for myself and I haven't really stopped when I was about eight years old. So in grade four, giving away my age, you know, and we had like those, those grades instead of whatever standard two back in the day. And I had a teacher in that grade in 
grade four, standard two. Her name was Mrs. Reed, incidentally. And she set us a challenge of reading 50 books in the year. And then she was going to take us to Milky Lane if we had completed the challenge. And I decided this was quite a good idea to work towards. And uh, within a couple of weeks, there was no sort of reason to, to have the ice cream as the bride to keep on going. Like the content got that much better. I think the first books that I read then were the Agatha Christie mysteries, which was quite wow. an interesting for an eight-year-old child considering that up until that point the only reading I'd done was the reading I'd done with very long teeth with my mother who was a particularly strict parent when it came to that sort of thing who made us do the homework in a very pedantic way which was completely unpleasant and I just thought I hated reading until you started doing it for yourself it's a very very different experience and uh yeah it just becomes a bit of a habit people yeah, I... often ask how do much well like you know you can pick up lots of different habits i don't i don't have many of the good habits that other people do have i'm certainly not one of the people who run around the suburbs on a saturday morning don't don't have a bicycle don't have a golf habit you know like <laughs> we can all fill out with the things that that work for us and this is a great hobby you can do it lying on the couch in your bed i mean it's <laughs> very <laughs> selfish exactly can you can you maybe like mention a few because i've been listening to a lot of jordan peterson well for years but uh, this weekend, especially, um, I actually, I've been doing a lot of woodwork lately and I like to just kind of put him on the, in the background. And, um, he speaks a lot about like the importance of like, I guess, communication, but, um, the, the importance of reading, how that can help you a lot in, in terms of your communication. I don't know if that's much what you've thought about yourself. Yeah, I think like, I, I don't know who it was that said that like reading is breathing in and writing is breathing out. And uh, we have to understand that, that the written word, much like language, is a human technology. I mean, like we're all talking about AI at the moment. It's not natural. It's something that we developed, but it's something that we've developed in order to order our thoughts in such a way that we can communicate them to other people. I think that what's great about reading is that it forces you to literally shut up and listen to someone else's point of view, particularly when it comes to nonfiction, but we can get into the sort of differences and why you read both. But when it comes to like trying to follow an argument, whether it's politics, philosophy, economics, whatever you into a scientific argument, when you are the reader, you have no choice but to sit and listen or to give up and move on to something else. You can't interrupt the writer. So the writer has the opportunity to present their entire argument to you. And that's the particularly in the book format. So this is what we lose when we're only consuming blog content or podcasts or whatever that case may be. You're only getting a bit of the argument and you're often getting the argument interrupted, right? Interrupted whether it's with advertisements, interrupted whether it's with reader comments, interrupted whether it's with your host or your guests like myself, that sort of breaks that argument. Whereas if someone sat down and written a whole book, you're getting their whole argument. And you don't have to agree with that, but you have to sit down and listen to them complete that thought, right? So that's the sort of the humbling side of being a, being a reader. Conversely, being a writer is something that we've done in order to order our own thoughts. Like if you're able to formulate a full argument, I mean, like I've said this quite a lot, I can like bang out a 600 word article in half an hour without even thinking about it because that's very shallow. But then you get the challenge to write a 2000 word essay for someone and suddenly it can take weeks, right? This is like a mountainous task. You've got to order your thoughts around. And when it comes to writing a whole book, obviously that's a that involves a lot of thoughts and a lot of structured thought that has to be thought out in a cohesive argument that can stand in and of itself. So you kind of have to see this as, as a way to communicate our ideas fully formed rather than the discourse, which is like your what your Socrates and all of them were doing back in the day, which is more about figuring out what you think. But like the act of writing and reading is consuming or producing fully fledged thoughts that have already been through banter, being through the grinding mill of observation and all those other things put together. So I don't know if that answers your question. But Yeah, no, no, it's it's a great way. I like I, I hadn't even thought about it that way myself. So so thanks a lot. So I think it's so amazing if you think about a book, like exactly what you're saying, you know, like, I mean, I like to treat them almost as textbooks, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's fiction or, or, or nonfiction, but like, you know, this person has spent, like you said, like, I don't know, hundreds of hours, maybe, you know, not just researching, but, but writing and then, and then rewriting and everything. And you have this privilege for like, whatever it is, $10, you know, I know books may be a bit more expensive in South Africa, but like, you know, and, and you, you got what, 15 hours sort of thing, you know, depending on how fast you read it, just to kind of take in this, I guess it's almost like a summarized version of their best thoughts and, and wisdom and knowledge. And it's just like, wow, like, why wouldn't you do that? You know, it's just like such a gift to be able to read books. 
Yeah, exactly. And particularly the gift to be able to read books, which I said, it is a very artificial, very human technology that we've done, but allows us to get into the, the heads and get into the thoughts of people that don't live in our time and space, right? So whether they're people that we don't have a, a common language with, whether people that we don't share a timeline with, whether the people we'd never interact with geographically speaking, it allows you to, to time travel and to actually converse with those people, to actually listen to what they what they meant as much as they were able to express it, which is which is a huge privilege. So it's a great technology, but I think it also comes full circle to what's going on now with like AI, where you can give it a five word prompt and it'll write a novel for you and you can be an author. And I would say, what's the point of consuming that content? Because you're not getting a uh, an actual person's point of view. If you're looking for a synthesized view, a sort of summary of everything that's gone on within the topic, that's very different. But that I would say, so using AI to create or to consume content becomes more of an academic exercise and less of a personal philosophical exercise, which sounds very grandiose, but like that's certainly why I read anything, whether it's fiction, whether it's nonfiction, whatever it is, I am reading in order to try and figure out what my own thoughts are which is quite different to the academic pursuit of just getting to the correct answer to answer whatever question or solve whatever problem you have immediately available to you. I think the act of reading is by itself a, a slower process than that. It's the sort of the, it's the, where the whole becomes greater than the sum of some of its parts when it comes to trying to figure out where you are, what, what we're doing in this world and all the rest of it, to try and sort of hang that knowledge onto each other and figure out what I, what I think. And uh, you can't do that if someone else is doing that for you. I've also had this argument with people with audiobooks, for example. Like, I think audiobooks are a great form of entertainment, but I don't think they solve the same thought ordering process, which I'm trying to talk about today, as actually reading. Because having a story read to you, which is something I did before I started reading for myself, as at that age of eight, or reading was something that was done to me rather than something I participated in. It's a passive act. So it's an act of consuming, but act not actually engaging with the content, whereas actually physically reading is a physical act. It's an engagement that you're actually engaged with. So even if you, even though you are there as a student to listen to the, to the, the writer who's put those thoughts on the page, you have to actively concentrate. You have to be part of that process and you can't actually let your concentration slip or you're going to have to reread that paragraph. Whereas if it's an audio book, someone reading to you, it's not like you're actually actively engaged in sort of that, that internal debate that you're not going to get to be relying on people to summarize that, whether that's an audio book, whether that's someone else reading to you, which is all lovely forms of entertainment, great for getting a story and like watching TV, nothing wrong with that. But I think it fulfills a very different purpose. And certainly not the reason that I read or the way I read or the fact that I read physical books as much as possible rather than on a screen, because I do know the science behind that. I know that I can prove it from my own anecdotal evidence that reading on a paperback book, you're going to retain more of that information. And what is the purpose of reading? Is it to just knock off saying you've read something because you're able to skim through it quickly on your shiny Kindle screen or whatever the case, or are you reading it to try and actually figure out your own thoughts? In which case, you know, like these, these human technologies that were designed for humans, we have to kind of use them in a human way if we're going to get what we want out of it. And again, ask yourself what you want out of it. If you just want to be entertained, you want to read some Jeffrey Archer or whatever you want to escape from the real world, by all means, go ahead and do it. But understand the difference of like the purpose of why you're doing these things. Is it entertainment, escapism, or is it some sort of form of personal growth that you're trying to get into? I think you should become a motivational speaker for reading. <laughs> um, you, it's, it's very encouraging. You sound, you make it sound like this this kind of beautiful art that uh, you you kind of don't want to miss out on if you if it, if you're someone listening to you for the first time. So I, I totally I totally agree with with what you're saying. And and it's interesting. It's a nice segue because. I uh, I reached out to Rich Richard Mulholland, who was a was a previous guest, and I was like, "Hey, Rich, um, I'm speaking with Bronwyn on Monday. I, I don't suppose you've got like some questions you'd like to ask her." And he's like, "Gareth, he's like, you've got to speak to her about Kindle versus dead tree book reading." And then he's like, and then I was like, "Okay, cool, I'll ask her." And then 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 I I was like you know that I'm a dead tree type of guy. Hey? And he's like, Gareth, I don't know if I can be your friend anymore. <laughs> and then he sends me this 15 minute video that he made on, um, on like why Kindles are better than, than sort of like hardcover or, or just sort of physical books. And, you know, he makes a good case and, and that you can't like, you almost can't argue with some, with, with most of his points um, because they are good points, but then, 
there's just there is a whole other argument for reading like physical books so his question was like yeah he'd like you to kind of defend your case a little bit more <laughs> uh, which you already have done so i don't know if there's anything else that um that you might want to add there well, I mean, like I've had this argument with with Rich before, like uh, many times. So you can find that on all different parts of the internet. I think we've had that had it on Twitter, on podcasts, on LinkedIn, all over the place. But I, I don't have anything against using it. I sometimes I, I do use it. It's portable. It's convenient. You can take many books with you in your in your one little device. But there are both philosophical and physical reasons why, if I'm given the choice, I'm going to go with the with the paperback. And, and I, I don't even like to read hardcovers because I've already mentioned one of my favorite things about reading is you can do it in comfort lying on the couch and hardback's just hard to hold up. I mean, soft cover is just more comfortable. So if you're going to choose between those two, you can just leave that as a, a side point. But physically reading off paper it does retain more information. We know this also with the act of writing, right? Or the act of learning. So as I said, reading, breathing in and writing, breathing out, I think we have kept kind of see that too. And to add the physicality layer to that, the more of your senses that are engaged when you're communicating with content, you're going to retain more of that information. Paper is also something that seems, it's, it's a very human technology once again, but it's something that we gravitate towards, kind of like cats, right? I mean, they like, they find us, even though they're not part of our evolutionary journey they're always part of our story this idea of paper tactile it does seem to trigger something in a in a weird little ape brains that make us make us engage with the story in fact this physical books have a smell and they have different smells this is also like very sub subtly sort of actually layering on things that create hooks for your memory to hang on to right and i do find that and with studying too like if you if you've ever ever tried to study for a formal exam at a high level where you've only had an electronic version of the textbook, how much harder it is to actually absorb that information, how much harder you have to work. I have to get out a pen and paper to do those math sums because now you can't envisage them on the page. So I think there is there's something there and I know that the, there is data to back that up too. But I think it's it's also from a more sort of philosophical point of view, I think that the act of owning a book, the act of ownership, the act of holding a physical object is something that we're losing more and more of. And there is this thing of digital fragility, like data doesn't have an infinite memory. It might have infinite storage or, or close to infinite storage. We can store so much information on tiny little microchips, but all that digital information does decay. And it often actually decays faster than physical goods. Like if you've ever, if you recall, again, giving away age, if your parents ever had like slides or VHS tapes of like home videos, if you haven't had those digitized into a new format, that information is lost. And very similar, this happens to our electronic copies of information, whether that is music, whether that is books, whether that is our photographs, our videos, whatever that might be. There's this digital sort of fragility that happens if you're not keeping up with the technology, you kind of got to lose those things. So, you know, you won't have like a library to pass on to your children. You won't be able to refer back to that book. Maybe it's no longer supported on your latest Kindle. Again, I had like a book club over the weekend and people were saying, oh, they've got an upgrade on their reader, but now they can't read the books they purchased a few years ago. That's frustrating. That's a that's a very simple frustration but at the more philosophical level once again it's this idea that you don't actually own anything that you have on your device even if you've paid for it because of the way copyright structures work the way that platform economy works the way the platform economics and monopolies work you don't actually own that copy and like one of my favorite case studies is what happened a few years ago with literally george orwell's 1984 which was suddenly deleted off many people's kindles because Amazon had a copyright issue with the publisher. I can't remember the exact backstory there. But anyway, you bought the book. It was your book. And then this book about digital dystopia and future, future politics literally disappears off your device because of some technicality. Just to remind you, you don't actually own that. And very similar, more recently, we have the case studies of publishers updating content within books that you might own. You might have your, your copy that you purchased of a particular book replaced with replaced with a updated version that might be corrected in terms of political correctness. So, you know, there was that whole drama about uh, what happened with Roald Dahl books, for example, that had been edited by sensitivity readers in the UK. So if you owned like an electronic version, you would just get the censored version overnight when that update took place, because you don't actually own the book. So you, it, it plays tricks with your memory too. You don't actually know what is true, what is real, what you did remember. You might have remembered a particular phrase from your childhood, but you find the later updates have different things. 
I think that that's something to be aware of when it comes to trying to store our memories digitally, which again, digital technology is another technology like writing. I'm not saying that like writing and books are unnatural by any, by any sense, but they do have, they do have different pros and cons. And I think you need to decide what it is that you want. I certainly read for sense making in my own head. I'm not reading just to make notes and turn them into PowerPoint presentations. Though I do do that. That is basically my day job. And I think Rich's day job is very, very similar. We read books looking for anecdotes and case studies we can put into content to put into articles, to put into presentations, to tell to people. But mainly I'm reading to make sense of things in my own head, which means that I want to be able to remember it. I don't want to only be able to remember it by going back to some bookmark that I made in a page. And I do find it quite strange. I've got like, I like to say, I don't have a proper photographic memory. I have like a photographic memory with like a faulty lens, right? So like, I'll remember, I'll remember what your phone number looked like, but I won't remember all the numbers. So I'll know it was either a six or an eight, you know, if I try to squint in my head, which means when it comes to trying to remember content I've read in a book, I can't remember what the page looked like. I can remember there was like a, there was like a mark in the corner of the page, which was torn there. And I can go back and I can quite find it quite easily easily. Whereas on like an electronic device, I, I find that information is kind of lost. The only way to retrieve it is by actually using the digital breadcrumbs that we would have put out for ourselves to go back and find that. But I think that's really, really interesting. I don't know how that works exactly, but I do think it has a lot to do with tactile and using more sensors when you consume information does create deeper memories that aren't in the sort of your, your RAM. They're more in your stored in your the deeper parts of your brain that actually come part of your personal philosophy going forward. Anyway, that's my that's my story. I know that Rich has reflected most of those points, but you know, we we're we're welcome to buy buy all of all things. I, all I know is that my favorite books I'd like I'd prefer to have a copy of. And I can give them to people. You exactly. can't give people don't own right you don't own any of that information you can't give it to someone they have to buy their own and of course they can buy a prime subscription get all the content they need and it's technically cheaper oh yeah i'm not sure it is because i certainly read a lot of economic stuff where getting a physical copy costs maybe a tenth of the price as it does on my e-reader which is extraordinary again copyrights monopolies and the unfairness of the global economy also play into a lot of my decision making there which is also quite economic. I think there's arguments to be made across the across the board of trying to pick in terms of economics, politics, and philosophy, what you're trying to achieve with every piece of content you're reading. I read this really interesting book a few years ago about the, I can't remember the exact type title. It's something like Analog Revolution. And uh. it was talking about like, for example, books, how you know, bookshop, bookshops were meant to sort of go out of business once like Amazon came along and stuff, but actually bookshops are becoming more popular. Uh, it was talking about yeah. like the, you know, the, the moleskin diaries. Um, yes. So like, you know, the, we were, like people were worried, like, oh, are we just going to sort of type things out now and, and store things in notes or whatever the story is. Um, but actually moleskins became more popular. Um, records have become more popular, like, for, you know, like old records <laughs> get you play music on. <laughs> the content that's so interesting <laughs> yeah so it was this whole book on like the the analog revolution and it was like wow all these things that we thought would sort of guard a fashion actually didn't and i guess the overarching reason is that something that you touched on now we we're always going to be human you know and humans have certain things that they like and one of those things is to touch and to hold and and to show you know like you you like to show people your your kind of like library or you know the books you've written in or whatever it is your record collection um and you can't do that you know if you show somebody your ipod or whatever they're like yeah whatever <laughs> you know what i mean um so so it's really interesting that that's kind of was something that has played out over the last i guess i don't know 15 or so years yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm glad you touched on that because the the words analog and digital, I think, are really fascinating. I think I wrote a very short blog post on it because, as, as I said, it's hard to write long things. Like it's much easier to read than it is to write. But there's this idea that anything that is digitized has been made discreet, which means it's had some nuances taken out. And even our very best rendering, and now we've got like ChatGPT and Midjourney and Dali and all these marvelous like electronic replications of visual and audio and soon to be other multi-sensory parts of reality. But the thing is we can only digitize what we can encode, right? Which we can pin down. And we pin down what we, what we think we see, but there's a whole lot of things that we're seeing, but we can't actually explain. And all those little nuances are lost. 
right? So it's like these it's these little gaps that creep into reality. Even the best camera captures reality with missing spaces because the colors that we see are coded colors, right? There's not that full spectrum. It's the same thing with like putting down music onto a piano as opposed to a guitar. The piano pins down music into discrete notes, whereas the guitar, you can play with that string and you can get the nuances in between the, the tones that we might not be able to articulate what the difference between that C and C sharp is. But the piano makes it discreet. The guitarist can play a little bit sharp, but not quite sharp, right? And that's that's a it's a very bad example. But every that happens with every part of our senses, with sound, with with lights, with with all of those things. When it's digitized, however high res it is, we're always going to be missing something. Those little things, and when we're missing, ironically, what we cannot define. And that's why we get this sort of uncanny valley effect. And I think that was very interesting through the work we did. We did a lot of future of work stuff when I, in my actual day job, and I'm not talking about this sort of stuff that I'm interested in, but, this, but it's still very interesting what happened with, with COVID and re remote like conversations with loved ones, right? And the NHS did a study and they found that with older people in particular, although it did sort of filter down with various different generations too, they felt more lonely after having a video call with their family members than if they'd had no contact at all. And I thought, this is really, really fascinating. It's like drinking salt water to try, to try and quench your thirst. It's like you're technically getting it, but there's something you're missing that makes you feel worse, right? It's, and it's those, all those little gaps. And I would try to fix this problem with like better holograms. And now like Microsoft wants to do like a, a video conferencing thing where the hologram is life-size, so it feels more real, but you still haven't solved the, the actual problem. Like what are those small things that we can't even define? The senses that we haven't been able to pin down onto a page. And it's very similar to what happens with sort of political science. And there's a great book called Seeing Like a State, which also framed for a lot of my thinking in this the difference between sort of digitized and discrete and analog and continuous in that when states try and manage a problem or when foresters try and manage a forest, when people try and manage nature and complex systems, whether it's through in politics or environments and everything that's going on with climate now too, we can only manage what we measure right and we can measure many things we can't measure everything because everything is connected you're always leaving something out of your model again like the, the covid models that told us how many people were going to die and where and what interventions would work the model is only as good as your inputs right <laughs> there's always a, there's always stuff missing which has catastrophic chaotic results further down the line so there's a lot of we missing i think, I think with them <laughs> the, the, there's one thing there's one thing that's um that sort of came up there for me was like we are energetic beings right that's what we are like we actually exchange energy all the time like especially with each other but then with other things other objects and stuff too and like like you said you can't measure that you can't measure that exchange of energy so no. like yeah like how do you replace that like how do you yeah there's just like the, the, yeah, that is just such an important part of how we are, you know? Yeah, and I think this comes into a lot of the conversations again now with future of work and where we fit as human beings with artificial intelligence and it's going to come for our jobs and everything else. And like we can create perfect versions of people, whether it's our brains or our bodies through technology and software and hardware and all these things put together. But it's still missing something, right? So we can create perfect workers. But we can't create perfect people right because people are greater than the sum of those parts that we're able to encode and we try to get closer and closer but it's almost like one of those sort of limiting equations right but you never quite get down to zero because you're only filling the gaps that you can articulate it's much like trying to define a, a turning test or a turing test you're going to say that can if the computer can fool the human then it can basically be said to be like a humanoid or a proper artificial intelligence, right? But any of those tests, as soon as we can define the test, we can encode an answer to break the test, right? But what can't we encode? What can't we define? That is the that's the real question. It's all it's all in the gaps. All the all the good stuff is in the in the gaps, and also all the value is in the gaps because. Quite frankly, nature doesn't need any of this stuff. It doesn't need our economy, anything else. The economy is also of human technology designed to help us get more of what we think that we want. So we create machines and technologies to get us more of what we think we want more efficiently. 
But that need, that drive, that wanting that makes us so flawed as human beings is a, is a totally irrational human construct, right? And that's why, that's why as much as jobs can disappear, jobs can only disappear by technological replacement because we can define what that job is. But those jobs all only exist to fulfill an undefinable need which marketers and salespeople know, right? I mean, like, why do we buy stuff? We buy stuff for status. We buy stuff for love. We buy stuff for belonging. We buy stuff because we have a, a hole in our human soul that we're trying to fill. So we're never going to actually solve that problem. Technology just gets us to sort of run faster on the treadmill. So I think that's an interesting way to frame sort of technological redundance. It's like, we just, we're just stripping away more of what we actually don't need at the end of the day, which is really, really interesting way to look at this. Wow, that is fascinating. Jeepers, you're giving me a lot to think about there. Uh, talking about creating, say, like perfect humans, I, I was I noticed on your your LinkedIn, it seems like you went under this sort of massive kind of evolution in terms of your 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 career and and studying too. Um, I, I'm assuming like you you had a career and then you decide you're like no no no. I'm going to just sort of um, upskill and I'm going to go study for like a few years and uh, and just change paths completely. Is, is that kind of what happened? Because it seems like you just like, I mean, you went to Bath and then LSE and Staley's and um, Manchester, like all these different universities and, and studying and stuff. So yeah, maybe just tell me a little bit about, about that, please. Yeah, it, it probably looks a lot more interesting on LinkedIn than it does in real life. I think the the sort of the the two minute version or the two second version is that basically I realized quite early on that I was unemployable, so I'd have to figure out some other way in order to make a living in this world. Uh, so that's why it, it seems like I've done quite a lot of things. But if you actually third sort of follow the string, it's not that complicated. I did a BCom. I studied marketing when I finished school. I got selected because I had really good grades to go on those sort of those bank programs and those consultancy programs where the big companies come and say, come on our training weekends. And after having a few of those interviews and conversations, I realized none of these companies was ever going to hire me because on paper, I looked like the sort of person that they'd hire. But in person... I just thought too differently, right? And what, what I realized quite quickly was all those good big employers were, wanted a very different type of person to work for them. They didn't want the smartest people. They didn't want new ideas. They didn't actually want, when they say in interviews, like, tell us what you do, or what you do around here. They like, they absolutely did not want that. So I, I, I it was it was quite a learning curve to know it was absolutely going to be rejected from any sort of corporate career. I had to think quite differently. And I ended up working only for really crazy people because I think there was something in me that like only crazy people were prepared to <laughs> prepared to invest in. And that's great because it means that I didn't really have a conventional career. I worked technically or nominally in marketing, but mainly only for really eccentric entrepreneurs, all of whom had a huge bent towards philosophy and towards economics, which was interesting. So again, I'd done a BCom. So when I went and went back and studied further, I managed, I went and got a postgrad in economics and a master's in economics, which I think is fascinating. I think economics is a good way to look at the world. Uh, people tend to think economics is like a big bad science, that it's prescriptive. But I think the interesting parts of economics is all about the diagnostic. It's actually being like a, a field study of humans and the choices we make and trying to figure out why. When you look at it like that, it's it's quite a benign subject. When you look at it from a prescriptive, trying to not only diagnose the problem, but prescribe the cure, that's where I think that the, that sort of field gets its bad name from. But at the same time, economics is kind of one side of the coin because it's all about trying to figure out what's happened. So it's quite backwards looking. And then what could happen in the future? So if this, then that. And that, of course, takes you not that, it's not that big a leap to start getting into the future space from either the sort of economics background or from the marketing background, marketing trends to futures and economics to futures is very much conjoined that's generally the two fields that people do work in future studies come from is either advertising and marketing or from economics i have both and what i think is great about tying those different ways of looking at the world together is they both the sort of left brain and right brain traditionally way of looking at things put together if economic way of looking at the world is about trying to come up with a uh, forecast it is very much trying to predict what's going to happen based on past performance and trying to figure out cause and effect then future studies is about trying to look at the other way around. It's about the opposite. Rather than trying to predict, it's going to try and ask what if 
how do you how do you actually go away from those school costs you've got so that ability to sort of both focus in and broaden out I think is a is a it's a good way to look at the world and again as I said I've been reading all my life I've been working for very strange people selling very strange things from supplements all the way through to uh, investing ideas but basically I worked as a marketing manager before I started working full-time with Flux Trends in 2015 where we do exactly that trends and future studies so taking both from the economic forecast and then trying to broaden that into what could be possible if we step off that that forecast scenario that we're looking at if that makes sense uh, totally totally you mentioned something really interesting there about like economics and it's a it's kind of a good way to understand the world and I guess even psychology or at least half of it the guy who kind of woke me up the most uh, is a man called Martin Armstrong I don't know if you've ever heard of him um, he runs a company called Armstrong Economics fascinating guy I can send you some information if you want after this but he <clears throat> he literally is like a an absolute expert in when it comes to uh, the the economy and history and law and and um yeah, he's just he's just a really really interesting guy but he he his main focus is on like finance and the world and and he was the guy who woke me up to to most things so it ties in a lot with what you just said there yeah i think some of the most interesting philosophers were are now termed to be economists right i mean it doesn't really matter what your political orientation was the most interesting thinkers always were thinking about economics and economics really being at its core, like what they'll tell you in the first lesson is the, is the study of scarcity, it's the study of choices, it's the study of if you have this, you can't have that, right? Which which is the unfairness of life, right? I mean, it's, it's there's always there's always got to be choices. I mean, I talk about this quite a lot in terms of like the, the darker sides of feminism and those sorts of things too. This idea that you can have it all is absolute nonsense, but you can choose what you're going to focus on that's that's what that's the choice and that's the choice that all humans have and this idea that you've got a finite amount of time if nothing else you've got a finite amount of most resources and how are you going to allocate that these are the most basic problems of humanity and we tend to think about economics more in terms of, sort of like macroeconomics and currencies and you know like jobs and labor and all the rest of it but fundamentally that choices and those those thinking tools about scarcity are about thinking about life how much of your life do you spend working how much of your life do you spend on leisure what are you pursuing what are you actually trying to maximize yeah so i think the tools are very are very useful they it does break down when you try and prescribe these things when you try and understand that you, you're trying to understand why humans make irrational choices and I think that's that's an interesting one. Again, one of the big cr sort of criticism around the whole field of economics is this idea of economists look at look at people as homo economicus rather than sort of homo sapiens, right? And I think that that's that's also a flawed way of looking at it because that's not the way the actual field looks at it. The field is just looking at the sort of choices that we actually do end up making. And most people do make choices in a particular direction. What we don't like is the results of those choices. So you can sort of blame the person who's sort of holding the magnifying glass to the ante, but that's not necessarily who we should have a problem with if we, if we don't like what we're seeing. The whole point is that our entire global economy, whether you live in a more Western or a more Eastern or a more global South, global North type economy, it's the sum, sum total of the choices that we've made, right? So <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what's quite uncomfortable about it. Nobody likes to be under the magnifying glass, just like nobody likes Facebook and what it stands for because it's basically a giant mirror of us. Yeah. We just don't like. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of a couple of books that I read. Um, there's also a podcast uh, called Freakonomics. Um, they, these guys, they, I forget their, their names now. Um, you probably know their names, but um, they, they wrote these two books um, called Freakonomics. And they basically applied, I guess, economic theory to real life situations. And it was just fascinating some of the some of the things they were writing about. I mean, I can't remember exactly. Like one of the things that stands out is like most drug dealers still live with their parents. Like, you know, and there was something around like children's seatbelts not necessarily actually being um that safe for, for children. Um so it was they they took like the, I guess, yeah. I guess, economic theory and how you apply it to real life situations. And the book was just fascinating. It just sort of like spat out all these things that you would, you wouldn't really consider like applying economics to. And then you're like, wow, really, really interesting guys. I don't know if you've um, listened to them yeah. or read their books. 
Yeah. Interesting pairing again of journalist and an economist that got together and it just asks interesting questions like and, and and the data quite often with things that we look at doesn't bear up to our assumptions and I think that that's what they really challenge this whole difference between our revealed and our stated preferences again a book that goes into that also written by an economist who does a whole lot more which is Robin Hansen and his uh, elephant in the brain book which looks again at how our stated preferences on follow through with our revealed preferences, which is based on our actions. And that's that's where economists do have an advantage over sort of sociologists or people that are that are looking at things from a sort of a, a morality perspective rather than a numbers perspective, is that the market does show what we have chosen. You know, so like sometimes that means that we need to disincentivize or incentivize certain behaviors in certain ways, whatever you sort of lean towards, whatever outcome you want, that's a different debate. But our revealed preference tells us what we actually want. You know, it's not quite often not what we say we want. And to, you know, there's so many, there's so many studies there. I think the most recently, the one that the one that got to me was that um, women who are seen to be overweight in the workplace have a 10% wage per penalty. So if you are overweight woman, you will earn 10% less than a thin woman in the same job in the same industry, all the rest of it. But at the same time, when it comes to recruiting, overweight women get more calls for interviews than thin women do, right? So we like say we want to be diverse and we do the, we do the diversity box ticking and like we totally body positive and we don't discriminate. But when it comes to actually paying people, we fall back on our same biases because that's what we actually want, which is really, really interesting. Yeah. And again, I think interesting the dating market is my favorite one to look at. Like we 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 all know by now that like tall men get more women. Like that's what women want. Let women have told us this is what they want in terms of their revealed preference on dating apps, right? Women will not go for a date with a, a cold date with a man who is not over six feet tall and has a master's degree. This is like basically the criteria that all kind of women want. But at the same time, there's other studies that show that short guys on average sleep with more men than tall guys. So women think that they want tall men and they optimize their behavior. That's a revealed preference, but it's a revealed trained preference. And when it comes to actually committing, it switches again. So I think these are all things, these are things that economists would look at and then try to figure out why this is. And a lot of it's a lot of the things that we think we want, we want because other people want them, right? That's uh, <laughs> so it's all it's as, as long as it's on the public domain. The dating field is quite different to sort of like in the bedroom, right? So when you're seen in public, you want to be seen with the person that meets the meets the social criteria. But anyway, people are very flawed. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's classic because I always um I've got quite a few uh, like redhead mates, and these guys always seem to end up with like the best looking girls. Like they marry the best looking girls. And I'm like, well, that's not what society wants you to think, does it? <laughs> you know, we're always like giving gingers like a, a hard time, but actually, you know, they're the ones that kind of end up winning when it comes to to getting girls with good looks. So it's quite, that's also quite interesting. Always, yeah. Like that, that revealed thing, like what, what, what are people actually doing? And are the choices that we're making getting us more of what we actually want? And do we even know what we really want? And that, that sort of comes down to that whole sort of digitized conversation we were having right at the beginning. Like, we don't know what we want. We don't, we don't know what we want. And that's why there will be room for us in the future to try and figure out. That's that's about all the stuff we buy and sell. Our entire market is based on trying to figure out what we want, trying to trying to, to get towards something that we can't actually fully define. Yeah. All the market. In the market is kind of in the irrational human mess, right? A perfectly a perfectly balanced economic market has no profit because everyone gets exactly what they want at the perfect price, and there's no, you know, there's no there's no gross inequality, but there's also there's no margin. Like everyone just works just to break even. So, and that clearly is not the way the world works. Absolutely, that's actually a very nice segue. Um, you seem like a very kind of energetic person. And uh, dare I say optimistic, uh, Rich, again, he asked another question. He said, you guys sat on a stage together in Santorini uh, a while back, and he said that you have a really uh, interesting and wise take on optimism in terms of optimists change the world. And I guess even if you're a pessimist, um, you need to think optimistically. So can you maybe just talk about that for a little bit? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't have described myself as an optimist, but then again, I look at my sort of revealed behavior and the sort of random risks I've taken in my past. And I'm like, you're totally an optimist because, you know, no pessimist would have tried to do that. That's insane, right? Only an optimist could have taken those sorts of risks. But when you really break it down is that a, a real pessimist would never get out of bed, right, at all, because what, what possibly good could happen? And, and that's the thing, only optimists win at anything. And not optimists in terms of, I think I'm happy, I think everything will turn out right. It's talking about a revealed preference optimism, which is the people that invest in anything, that start any business, that apply for any job. These are all acts, very, very definitive acts of optimism. If you didn't believe it was any going to be any good, you wouldn't go out and do it. This is where like, you sort of discouraged job hunters come from. These are people that are not even going to look for jobs. They've given up looking for a job. That's a pessimist, right? So the only, only the optimist will actually get the job that is available. I have a few jobs that are available. Only optimists would ever start a business. No pessimist will start a business ever, which means that all the winners in the world are optimists. Of course, many of the losers are optimists too, but that's the whole sort of risk reward equation. You can only, you can only <laughs> win if you're gonna put some skin in the game. But that becomes quite quickly, it turns into kind of a moral obligation towards optimism, but not optimism in terms of an attitude again, optimism in terms of pragmatic optimism or revealed optimism, optimism through doing things. And I think that the sort of the, the case study Rich was referring to there is something that I've looked at again in the South African context quite clearly, but I think it applies to really wherever you live, that you have in terms of your revealed behavior, some people are revealed optimists about their countries and other people are revealed pessimists. You're a revealed optimist if you are purchasing a property in the country that you live in, if you are starting a business, if you are investing in a local business, you are a revealed optimist then. But it has a compounding effect too, because revealed pessimists would be people who don't purchase property, don't start a business, and instead hedge their bets by taking their money out of the country, right? So you're going to invest it offshore, maybe in Bitcoin, you know, like going to bet against this here because I don't believe in this here. That's a revealed pessimism against the place that you're in. But it also creates a vicious and virtuous self-fulfilling prophecies where after you've either been a revealed optimist or a revealed pessimist. If you're a revealed pessimist and you've now hedged your bets, taken your wealth, your capital, or your labor, that's your actual sort of getting a job offshore, you have now also created an incentive to ensure that your society does not succeed. Because the arbitrage condition is, if your local country, your local economy declines, you get richer. Mm -hmm. So the Bitcoin my favorite one there as soon as you purchase bitcoin you're betting against your domestic currency as soon as you purchase bitcoin you're happy every time your domestic currency declines in value right so suddenly you have this perverse incentive to become an accelerationist to tear things down around you and the opposite is of course if you're revealed optimist and you've invested in property as simple as that sending your kids to a local school hiring someone, starting a business, not only are you invested in trying to make your business grow or to make sure your property looks good and your verge is taken care of, you're also incentivized to make sure the community around your property or your business is also thriving. Because if you have a business and, you, and your customers are poor, you don't have customers, right? So you kind of invested in making your society better. Likewise, you purchased a house you're incentivized in making sure your neighbors clean up their dog poop from down the road too, because that reflects on your property value. Of course, that's a very local example, but it rolls out to the whole national scheme. And in fact, it rolls out to the whole human project at a much grander level. If you're a revealed pessimist, like some of the people I've interviewed in terms of antinatalists, and I mean, it's quite hard to argue that none of us asked to be here as human beings, but as an antinatalist, you're certainly not going to engage in the act of dramatic optimism of having children, right? So by simply not having children, you are increasing the, the odds that the human project dies out one day. You have not cast, cast your vote, your genetic votes into the future of our species. It's a, it's, it's a choice you've made. Whereas if you have decided to have a child and to carry it to term, you have cast a vote, a very tangible vote in terms of the future of the species. And again, these are self-fulfilling prophecies. So not only have you had the, the optimistic action of having a child, of carrying that child to term rather than terminating that pregnancy, you've made that choice, 
now once the child is here, you're also incentivized to make the planet nice to you know, make sure that the climate change is mitigated as much as possible in your neck of the woods, that you're not polluting things, that you're voting for good governments because it's not just about getting as much social security payout from your government as you can before you die at the age of 80. It's also about what's going to happen to my grandkids, right? So it, be, it it rolls out at quite a grand scale. And again, people find this very, very controversial. People don't like talking about optimism. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Bruce Whitfield and his book, The Upside of Down, and how much hate speech the poor man has got because he dared to be optimistic about South Africa in this point in time and to highlight good case studies. People get angry about optimism because the way I've articulated it sort of strips that revealed preference versus your stated preference veil away and you're forced to look at your own actions to determine whether you are an optimist which is not about being happy you know about being excited about tomorrow it's about are you invested in tomorrow in this place in this time or not and that means that it's a it makes you look at yourself again it's like the, the facebook as a mirror <laughs> to society and to yourself and your own past digital footprint it's a mirror that puts the magnifying glass onto yourself and makes you part of the problem or part of the solution which all of us are right because we all deciding whether to act in acts of optimism or pessimism all the time and when you articulate it like this you see that those acts of pessimism have a cost not just to yourself but to your greater community which is very uncomfortable nobody likes that nobody likes nobody likes to know that they actually matter as much as we say we do much like we all say we want freedom but freedom is costs a lot you know <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like reminded of the agency but it's the most important thing we have wow that's a great way of of looking at it you know um having that sort of like mirror put back on you, uh, the, the revealed optimism. I wonder if, can you be both? Can you be like optimistic, like in terms of like you, you buy, you know, property and you invest in a local business, but then you, I guess you hedge your bets, like you buy Bitcoin, for example. It, what do you call those sort of people? Is, is that like an okay trait to, to have? Well, well, of course, it's it, again, it's, it's it's the risk reward equation, right? So I had this conversation with a corporate client last week when they were saying, or we were looking at it a bit more technically in terms of future scenarios and what weighting probabilities towards more optimistic and more pessimistic scenarios. And again, I was like, well, that depend the, the weight you throw behind it is going to increase the odds of one of those two things happening. So the more evenly you hedge your bets between bad scenario A and good scenario B, well, then you then you achieve kind of nothing. You know, like you're not you're not you're not actually part of the problem or part of the solution. You're trying to sort of sit on the fence. Whereas the more weighting you put towards the things that you want, the more or well, the more optimist, optimistic scenarios, the more more influence you have on getting towards that. Like again, that's not that's not what anyone wants to hear. No one wants to hear that. Like no one wants to hear you want to lose weight. You got to go run. You got to go and like eat beans. No one wants to hear that. No, no one wants to hear that. <laughs> well, I mean. <laughs> it's sensible to sort of not put all your eggs into one basket but again you don't have to necessarily invest in like nihilistic choices for your for your sort of sig and hedging you might decide that you want to invest in not just one business but to invest in two maybe this one's got offshore exposure and that one doesn't you know like there's, there's different ways to to hedge your bets but hopefully if you hedge more of them towards investing in constructive things that you want more of rather than investing against things that you don't want because as soon as you start investing against things that you think you don't want suddenly you become actually invested in a case that you thought that you didn't want going into it so i think that that's the question so it's rather than sort of saying should you hedge your bets or not uh hedging is is what we should be avoiding rather than we should be trying to distribute our risk across various scenarios that we do want to see more of because and, and this is not just in terms of capital so in terms of your attention your time and where you sort of put in your energy going forward rather distributed across various different possible optimistic scenarios or things that you want rather than sort of distributing it equally against both positive and negative outcomes i think that's the that's the sort of the the mandates and again not not something anyone wants to hear no one wants to hear this no one's like <laughs> Give me an easy way out. And, and let me be perfectly honest, as an economist, I can tell you 
The people who've made the most money in this world are people who have bet against fortune and bet into other people's misfortune, who have been highly incentivized to watch the world burn. They have been the most successful people in terms of pure capital gain. But let's go back to what we were speaking about earlier in terms of the great maximizing economic equations of life. What is it that you're here for? You know, like, what are you, what are you actually wanting? And if it's exactly. just pure capital, Disaster capitalism is everywhere. Go ahead and loot those stores, right? But just don't don't be fooled that you're not a looter. Yeah, just you're not exactly you... going to get happy by doing that, are you? Because you've looted through a hedge fund or looted through a short trade, whether it was the GameStop saga or betting against the entire world in 2008, you know, like good old Michael in, in the big short. Yeah, you know, you can do that. Yeah. You might even get rich i mean like i'm not i'm not here to tell you to tell you what to what your morality should be but i am i am saying maybe maybe think about your the grand maximizing equation of your life and what you actually want more of because we do get that we get more of what we pay attention time and capital to and if other if you're making decisions in that direction chances are someone else's too so this is how decisions compound and this is why recessions happen because it's the, the herd effects. There's a great book, Narrative Economics, that explains that in great detail, how sentiment actually deepens recessions and upswings because we kind of follow each other. But again, think about what you really want, you know? <laughs> As a, someone who like focuses on future trends, what do you think people should kind of be aware of uh, that could be impacting them like on an individual level that I guess if they they don't do it, they might kind of get left behind. Is there anything in particular that you've been sort of analyzing? I'll probably answer this question the other way around. I think there's, there's things that you can focus on that will actually end up making you get further behind further along if you look for farther ahead into the future. I think the great examples there are among them Let's, let's talk about what was it, our, our new king of Britain. A few years ago, he said, like, what will what, happen to all the coal workers, you know, when we switch to the, to the green energy transition? And I think he said, you know, let them build solar panels, right? So this is, this is a sort of a tail-eating snake kind of a, a circular logic that's going to get you absolutely nowhere. If you're sort of focusing on skill sets that are going to keep you ahead of whatever technological trend or political trend is popping up, you're going to be playing that game your whole life because already now, as I predicted, the, the latest wave of headlines that we see are coming from across the world. They started off like criticizing China, but now they're popping up in the US and the UK and I've seen here in South Africa too. They're talking about how solar panels are decimating basically whole ecosystems in the deserts where they put up and turning turning like whole patches of land completely barren, which means that in the not too distant future, solar panels are going to be deemed just as dirty as coal is and we're going to move on to the next thing. So if you had reskilled as a coal miner to be like a, a solar panel builder, within a few years, you're also going to be known as a pariah because you've basically been exploiting cobalt mining children in the heart of Africa or the Peruvian desert or whatever the case may be. You're still going to be on the wrong side of of, of history, right? Because you're not thinking further along the head as to what that curve is. And you see the same thing playing out in technology. Like the absolutely worst place to be right now is to be like a data analyst or like a, a, a mid-tier software programmer, right? Because these are tasks that AI is designed to do because they are entirely quantifiable tasks. There is nothing discrete or analog about those tasks. They are defined from the beginning, much like we were talking about earlier as being digitized, which means they can be automated, they can be replaced. So it's very frustrating when we kind of hear politicians telling schools they're going to sort of focus on coding in school, coding for kids, all the rest of it, we're gonna switch our sort of educational tax that way, much like outcomes-based education was the thing. Now we're gonna to switch to coding, but those skills are like tail eating snakes. Like it's, uh, they, they have a very, very short half-life and they are designed to be automated because they automated tasks to, to stick with. So I think that we need to think a bit further ahead if you do want to stay ahead, if you want to feel like you have some control, some agency over your future, We've got to take that step back and kind of see not just the noise, but also the pattern as to where things are headed. And the pattern is to what is being automated and why, what is going to get faster and what's going to stay the same. And I think that there was, there's of course been lots of discussion with, again, the economists like Tyler Coe, and he brought out the great stagnation, which talks about how many very, and also, also where's my flying car? Like there was a also a book called 
by that name, but also spoke about how over time, a lot of the things that really mattered to us have actually slowed down or gone backwards rather than actually sped up. And we tend to focus only on the fastest moving things, again, like technology and what's happening in the world of climate change and all these sorts of noisy topics. And if we sort of focus our attention there, we miss out on the things that are actually falling behind, where real opportunities are, where problems are not going to stop arising. And at the core of that is, of course, the general human needs, like what what drives us forward, these quests for immortality, for love, for belonging, those things are never going to go away. So you're always going to find a space in that space if you want to have be a part, a valuable part of the future. The other place to look is the slower moving trends. Again, things that people need in terms of housing and energy and food and water, which are slower moving and tend to be less exciting than artificial intelligence, sentient godlike computers, whatever the case may be, the, the flash word of the day, whether it's metaverse or blockchain or whatever the case may be, people are going crazy about sort of slowing down and looking at the slower moving cycles and trends that will make you definitely have an easier life if you're looking for a place in the future. Because of course you can try sort of surf those fast moving waves, but those are waves designed for winners take all, right? They're designed to be asymmetric. They're designed to be automated and to be replaced in the future. And it's not going to be the space where you're going to find the most longevity as a person. They also less deep in terms of the, the sort of meaning equation again if you're actually looking for like many people did over the last few years it's life audits and figuring out why you're even bothering to work in order to just pay your bills and all the rest of it when you sort of look behind you at those slower moving shifts and those deeper needs you'll be able to build a career build a space build a life around solving problems that do have more meaning to people like Solving the problem of writing a novel faster through a AI prompt is not going to make you feel like you've achieved anything, right? It's not going to not going to tap into any of those needs, which is why we find lots of people across the developed world looking to do things like go back to their grandparents' farms in Italy, right, to sort of grow grapes because it feels more meaningful, even if it's less productive. It will feel like be part of something, and that's the irrational human whole condition so look for ways to lean into the irrationality rather than into the rationality because anything rational can be digitized can be made entirely discreet and can be automated right so that's not that's not a place of resilience if you're looking for a space in the future again that wasn't a particularly eloquent answer but hopefully that sort of shifts thinking towards looking at the slow looking at the things that aren't going to change and looking at things that will actually make you feel good about yourself. I think that because other people are feeling the same way. I love that. Actually, it was a great answer. It gave it gave me a, a lot to think about. Um, I was just wondering if you were, say, going into a, a school of, uh, let, let's say, a high school or primary school, doesn't matter. But like, if you're going to go do a, a talk there, what would you say would you kind of like repeat what you've just said now like what would you say like for them to think about the future in terms of prospects and um finding meaning and that sort of stuff i'd probably give the same sermon but hopefully in a bit more sort of eloquence and a bit more broken down kind of format in fact i'm going to do one of those to school parents and teachers on wednesday so hopefully i do have a i do have my thoughts better formulated in that regard but essentially yes it's, it's this whole idea of why are we doing the things that we're doing? The, uh, what my business partner, Dion Chang, speaks about quite a lot is when it comes to young people and looking ahead at their futures, we put so much pressure onto 18-year-olds to essentially set the course of their life in motion in a sort of a, a completely bringing up the drawbridge kind of a way. Sort of pick a career, pick your four-year degree, and then that the, all those other sort of branching paths get closed off to you. And what's so depressing about that is that your brain only stops developing or is fully developed at around about the age of 23 or 25, depending on what gender you are, which is really, really interesting, right? So we asked to make these irrevocable choices at a time when we're making the worst choices in our lives. Again, there's a social media meme going around that every woman I've ever met will agree with. And that is, why is the worst person you ever dated the person you dated when you were 19? It's because you make terrible choices at that age. And like we asked to make these irrevocable choices about our career at the same time, we're making the worst possible choices in our personal lives. It's, it's insane. We set ourselves up for failure. So I think the message is you've got to be sort of more patient with yourself. The, there's no sort of destination here. You don't win life. Uh, Seth Godin, I think many people would be familiar with. He's the famous author of The Purple Cow. He's written one of the longest running daily blog newsletters forever. He said something quite profound in that regard quite recently in that life's not a game you win. You die at the end, right? Like 
that's just it. Like it's it's what you're doing with all this with the with the sort of space that you have, and what are you maximizing for? What is it that you really want? If it is pure money, then by all means, go find yourself some shorting opportunities. Some go find some go find some poor Asian or African governments and start a coup. You know, like be the problem you want to see in the world, and then bet against that. If you that sort of cynical, if that's what you really want, but I don't think that is what 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 most people want. I have a theory that what most people want in one way or another is immortality. And we find that through various different means. We either find that through genetic reproduction, through having children, which is something that most people still do want, even if the world is telling us the opposite. Most women now my age who have been saying for the last 20 years they don't want children are now panicking because they don't, they're not sure their eggs are going to last out until they find the man, find the house, get the job that they want because there's something about us very irrationally that wants to procreate. So, you know, like there's this whole idea of finding immortality through passing your genes through time into the future. But there's also immortality through things like legacy, right? And that is in terms of leaving something of lasting meaning. And again, that thing of lasting meaning is not going to be a teleprompted, bot-written novel that was put together with five minutes of effort. Leaving something behind, I think some of the best legacies people have left behind, going back to our earlier conversation, are through books. Some of them quite small, books with ideas that have changed the world, whether it's sort of Henry George and his ideas of Georgism that are coming through now, many years after the man has died. That's a legacy, right? This legacy of leaving something behind that outlived lives you. It might not be your genetic footprint. It might be through some act of work. And then of course, the other way people find meaning is through looking at some sort of idea of an afterlife, right? So that's sort of some sort of religious cause or metaphysical cause that I think many have given solace and peace to many of us in, in the past. But that's something that we've kind of forgotten or tried to walk away from over the last sort of, you know, few generations across the world. But I think it's really interesting, again, if you sort of look at the actual data, which you kind of hide from, revealed preference, how when it comes to nuns, that is N-O-N-E-S, people who don't believe in anything, their population is about to drop off the map. We're going to have a lot more religious than non-religious people, simply because quite a lot of the non-religious people lived in highly de-growing populations, largely in the communist world, where they're simply going to die out, right? So we're going to have a lot more religious people running around. Also, that's something to sort of think about. This whole pursuit of meaning is going to become more important, not just in a numbers game, but also in terms of what we've seen through COVID. Again, talking to young people, looking at how many people dropped out of the workplace, participated in those life audits, and decided not to go back into the careers they had before they had that chance to pause. I think that that's a lesson for young people to say, you know, People not that much older than you regretted the the paths they went onto because they followed the journey they were told to follow. You have a very unique opportunity and point in time in history in that you have that example. It's not, it's within living memory. You saw your parents or your older brothers and sisters or people that you knew, prominent figures in social media, whatever the case is, stepping out and doing something else. You can choose that from the beginning. You don't have to go through that path yourself. So again, I think a lot of people think need to think about their, their longer term immortality, whether that's through deeds or through or through literal seed or through their creed, whatever the case might be. Think about that. Think about the, the sort of legacy that you want and plan your life according to that, which is, which is not a destination. I think that's the fundamental problem that we've had is this idea that life is a series of things to be achieved, steps to be taken rather than, and then with the sort of ultimate goal of getting a gold watch and going on a cruise, hopefully before you die. Right. I mean, like that's, that's not very exciting, <laughs> but to see it, see the whole thing in its, in its whole, I think that's the, that's the message. Hopefully we can, we can give to younger people when thinking about their careers. And again, this ties directly into your value in society going forward in that everybody else is grappling with these questions too. And if you are able to help people with their immortality, whether that's through extending their actual lifespans through health science, whether that's through helping people to have children in a world where fertility is declining, whether that is through how people improve their nutrition so they live longer, healthier lives, whatever that case may be, or helping people find meaning and create legacies with other people, that's when you're going to find a valuable career path. And even the word career is probably going to fall away because people don't want careers anymore, nor should they. But this is where you're able to 
both add value to society and be valued. And I think that that's where the other side of the coin needs to come in. And that many people think that we're going to move past the sort of the post-work economy towards a sort of universal basic income, fully automated lower middle class communism going ahead. That doesn't answer any of those questions that I've spoken about. It doesn't help people find meaning, find legacy, or any of that, because that replaces human value with a human price. And we have to sort of focus again on not just adding value, but also being valued by people, because that is such a, a human need that we want. And that's where all those ideas of immortality come from. It's about wanting to be valued, to leave something of value, whether that is a building, a book, a child, whatever that case may be. We want to be valued and taking people away people's ability to be valued is certainly not going to solve our problems. Wow. Again. The 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 optimistic person in you came out there for sure. Like um that's that's really, really great. Like given I think giving people a lot to think about there because I think people are worried about the future. You know, they they worried about like uh, AI and um, you know, technology taking jobs and just like this kind of like robotic state. Um, because well, what uh, well, they just don't like it, you know. So the what you sort of said there, like it gives us something really to focus on, which is that we are always going to be humans. We're always going to have this longing for human things um, and meaning and purpose. So don't like neglect those things. Those things are actually going to become more important than ever. So if you are going to do something like career-wise, focus on those things, the sort of feely, touchy things, um, not just physically feely, touchy, but also like emotionally feely, touchy. Like that's where there's a lot, you know, you mentioned that there's space in the gaps and there's, there's the juices in the gaps, um, the opportunity is in the gaps. And I feel like AI is creating a lot of those gaps. So that's something really cool for us to focus on, it is, you know, anybody really, but especially sort of youngsters, you know, don't lose hope that we're going to become these flipping crazy robots. You know, we are going to remain human and we're going to have those human necessities going forward still always. Yeah. Focus on what's valuable to you is valuable to someone else. And none of this makes sense. And don't confuse value with price, right? Because expensive things aren't necessarily the sort of the valuable things. And, uh, and that's where you're going to find your value and to be valued and solve those problems for you, not just yourself, but for other people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just one thing that, that I'd like to touch on sort of before we start wrapping things up is like going back to kind of like human things. Uh, you, you've re recently written about uh, breathing, right? It's like how, I mean, obviously it's like if you don't breathe, you die, but like there's a, there's a kind of deeper layer to that. Like there's this real trend on like people focusing on breathing and like breathing coaches and stuff like that. Um, is this something that you guys like advise, like sort of businesses to uh, teach their staff, like, you know, have a breathing coach to help people like lower stress and anxiety and maybe find more clarity? Um, because I find like I'm actually a breathing coach as well. One of the things I studied in, in India. And for me, this is like, I mean, it's like revelationary um, how powerful it is. So maybe you could just talk a little bit about your kind of ideas around breathing. Well, I like, I like the breathing example. We don't, we don't teach breathing ourselves at Flex Trends. We certainly have used it as case studies and we brought in breath work experts for some of our events and immersions we've done with corporate clients, because uh, as you said, like some people have been trained in this, it is a profession and we respect that. But I think breathing is interesting because like a lot of the things that I've spoken about today in terms of like your, your expectations literally shaping your reality and all that, at superficial level, they sound quite metaphysical and quite like, woo, and all that, which is not something that I am at all. But um, when you interrogate it, this is, this is just basic physics and science, right? Like in, in terms of the expectations equation, if you think it's going to rain tomorrow, or if you think that, to use the better example, my favorite one, it's like, if you think that we're going to run out of toilet paper during lockdown, you're going to go buy more toilet paper than you need. And yes, the shop will run out of toilet paper. Everyone thinks the same way that you are. So expectations have just created your reality. Like just by thinking about it, there it is. Very practical. Same thing with the breathing space, right? I mean, like breathing 
when you get into it, like most of us don't breathe properly, mainly because we have lived quite sedentary lifestyles. We breathe enough in order to live. We don't breathe enough to optimize our bodily functions, right? So if you're able to breathe using both your diaphragm and your lungs, most people never figure this out. I did learn about it quite early on in my life because I did a lot of vocal lessons and singing lessons when I was a small child. And then one of the first things they teach you when you sing is to breathe from your diaphragm. And like, we didn't even know how to make our diaphragms move. I mean, obviously our diaphragms are moving in the background. We had no idea how to control that muscle at all. And that's how you're able to hold notes. That's how you're able to get through a whole long phrase. And how much of that time, and you realize how little you were actually breathing before. And you also realize how good you feel after you have breathed properly, how it feels like you've actually exercised, you feel healthier because you're actually getting that oxygen you need. Oxygen is such a basic part of humanity into, into your blood cells. So you're feeling more energetic, your brain's working better, you feel fitter, you can do things that you couldn't do before simply by learning how to control those muscles, just like anything else, any of our other muscles that we use, the more you're able to control and the more things you're able to do with it. But I think that also I do obviously quite a lot of public speaking. If you don't breathe properly before you get on a stage, you are going to run out of breath. If you run out of breath, you're going to lose your train of thought and you're not going to perform as well. It's a very, very basic sort of thing there. But it, there's also all the other sort of benefits that you only see further on, which you can definitely speak more to. But I think in terms of sort of mental clarity, in terms of confidence, in terms of just being able to control quite a lot of those undefinable feelings we were speaking about earlier, but by, a, by focusing on your breathing, by concentrating on optimizing at least that part of your physicality, you are able to control a lot of those sort of subconscious emotional cues that would otherwise be impacting negatively on your performance. So maybe you want to speak more to that. I'm definitely not a breathwork expert, but I'm someone that does definitely know the benefits of just spending a bit more time concentrating on taking, taking air in and optimizing that intake. We are air is such a basic part of, of the human physicality. We should learn how to, how to use that better. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, you know, you touched on it, but people are actually not breathing properly. You know, even we have mouth breathers and it, it, you should really be breathing through your nose. And you'll notice if you breathe through your nose, you actually, you do actually like your tummy does actually sort of extend and it, like sort of that, there's the diaphragm part of things. So, you know, it's uh, we designed a certain way, but we've become almost lazy in terms of um, how we breathe, for example. And it's uh, it's it's a really good thing for us to go back and um, revisit these kind of like ancient kind of ways of doing things. You know, although they're not really ancient, they 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 should be present. Um, so so just a question I like to ask everybody as as a avid re reader, I can imagine it's going to be really hard for you to almost answer this question, but. Are there two books in your life that you could maybe recommend to the listeners that have had like a huge impact on you in terms of your worldview or how the world is run? I don't know if there's any that stand out. Oh, sure. I'll, I, I often recommend the first one and the second one I'll just bring up because I was talking about one of my some more literary book friends and we both agree that it's one of the best books ever, ever written. But um, the, the first one would be The True Believer which is basically a book written by a doc worker, but it's just his own philosophy on life. It's just crazy. So like what this guy thought of and how he was actually through the back of that work actually invites to consult with presidents, all the rest of it. So it's a book about basically about freedom, about philosophy, about living in society. And it was written in the sort of mid last century. So obviously a very tumultuous time in terms of politics and all the rest of it. So Eric Hoffer's The True Believer, I would definitely recommend that. Also a very short read. It's something you can pick up and put down. It's quite anecdotal, so quite small segments to get through. But I think he he was a very good observer of human nature and he had some good ideas to partake in there. And then the other one that I would, I'm recommending to people again now would be Terry Pratchett's Nation, which is actually written for young readers. I'm unashamedly a total fan of Terry Pratchett's. Nation is not one of his famous Discworld novels. It is a standalone novel about essentially a young boy on a Pacific island who loses his family in a tsunami and what happens there. But it's also, it's a, it's a great showcase of what Pratchett can do. His also keen sense of understanding human nature, which is something that's always good to get a handle on. And it's just beautifully written. So if you want a good book to just 
best read also not particularly long I don't think that the length of the book is a great indication of its quality quite the opposite I have separated my books into the ones I love and the ones that I've just read and the the shelves are they almost directly correlates it in terms of the, the the shorter the book the more I've liked it and this is this is speaking as someone who's read hundreds of the things a year <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me I always speak to my dad about like books we will share books that we've read and then he'll he'll always like go yeah I think they could have probably reduced it by like 50 percent <laughs> um, which is pretty true there's a lot of kind of fluff in in, in many books um Incidentally, why I think many contemporary books are bad, and that's because publishers nowadays are looking at it from a point of economics rather than publishing the best ideas. They're trying to publish commercially viable ideas. I said this to someone who has published books. Like books are commissioned based on word count, which means automatically you filling towards a certain direction, or you cutting back. Some some great novels have been extraordinarily large, like George Eliot's Middlemarch. I wouldn't take much out of that. That's a different standalone, but now we sort of try to fit sort of, you know, novels into sort of 60,000 words and business books into 30,000, whatever the case might be, right? And writing to word count is not going to get you the best answer at all. I mean, even talking talking recently, I think there was a an article that came out that said none of Hemingway's books would have been published. They're all too short to be published today, right? So can you imagine if you sort of like, you know, doubled up on the old man in the seat to try and meet some publisher's word count? Of course, it's going to be terrible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh, really, it's so interesting. Um, so, so Bronwyn, what um, what are you kind of most excited about uh, for the future? It could be personal, or it could be just the future in general. Um, and uh, where can sort of people get hold of you if you've got any events coming up or new books or anything? Then also please share those. Yeah. So to answer your first question, I think that I, I'm trying not to be excited about any one thing. I think I would like to be surprised. I think that. I actually do like chaos and surprise, which I think many people don't. I realize that all the bad choices I've made in my life have been because I've tried to make more chaos out of a mundane situation rather than the other way around. So I, I do fully admit I'm the exception, not the rule here, but I'm looking forward to being surprised. I'm looking forward to more chaos to survive through, which, which, is, which is probably something that could actually happen right because i do think that we are still in the middle of a bit of a for those who do subscribe to it i think it's kind of hard to argue at the moment that we are in a bit of a sort of turning situation now where a lot of long-run trends have culminated in the current tumultuous period which is likely to extend for a good few years we have issues in terms of the environment in terms of politics in terms of economics none of which have landed into a stable equilibrium. So I think we are going to be stuck with some chaos and I'm quite happy with that. And I'm looking forward to being surprised. I think the worst thing that could happen is a homogenous deterministic future. I think that that's probably what scares me the most about artificial intelligence is not taking people's jobs, but rather us adopting a homogenous version of technology that then becomes a overriding consensus view that we work towards almost like a instead of a one world government a sort of a one world idea of whether it's morality or economics or whatever the case might be i think that'd be very depressing so i'm looking forward for surprise and chaos so more agents of change and i think we might get some especially in the next couple of years and then in terms of where you can find us, all information of what I'm doing at the moment is on the website flextrends.com. You can see our latest, our latest events there. We do salons, which are quite discursive, trained breakfast sessions about once a quarter. And we have coming up towards the end of next month, we're doing an immersion tour where you can meet a whole lot of pragmatic optimists or solution-based innovators, all of whom are under the age of 25. In other words, fitting into South Africa's born free generation, or into the sort of global Gen Z generation, which we're quite excited about because quite frankly, we're getting quite old and we're quite interesting to see what the next group of people are going to do differently. Very cool. And um, people want to get in touch with you, follow you, social media. Is there any one that you have as a favorite or two? Or <laughs> I think I'm on most of the major platforms under my name, Bronwyn Williams, quite easy to find. Otherwise, again, if you head on over to the flextrains.com website, all of our personal and company socials are there and you can generally see what we have to do. Okay, amazing. And then the last question is, uh, what does being ridiculously human mean to you? Uh, it, it means leaning into the chaos. It means following the things that you want rather than the things that you are supposed to want. 
And it's about sort of tasting with all of your senses, right? So pick up that paperback book, Rich, <laughs> and experience the full bouquet of the, of the sensory environment that you have to play with. Yeah, that's amazing. You, you, you've got this incredible brain um, and I'm, I'm truly thankful for the way that you think. And like, obviously all the books you've read have made you this really like wise lady um you know you, it's it's hard to kind of like put you in sort of a, a back a, a bucket you know because you just have this huge kind of diversity of knowledge um and it's just fascinating uh, chatting to you you, you like it, it almost wasn't what i expected in some ways you know like you gave me this whole kind of like other side of things to think about which i think are the really important side of things you know like we we said these are the things that you can't measure actually that's where we should focus on in life you know and and there's so much there to focus on let's not get caught up in all this other rubbish like seriously i mean we can we need to know what's going on jobs are made up anyway you know like let them do the work <laughs> yeah so so thank i just want to say thanks so much for for coming on on the show you've been an incredible guest it's been really interesting chatting to you your energy has been great and it's uh, it's an absolute pleasure so really really enjoyed it today Thank you for inviting me. Although I must say that's the first time I've ever been called wise, I think. I think we generally prefer to refer to ourselves as court jesters, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> Cool. Well, that's awesome. Cool, Bronwyn. Listen, that's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> cool.